Well, hello, Leo. It's nice to see you again. Uh, thank oh. you for joining the stuff that growth is made of. Uh, what I'd love to do is start with a brief introduction of our distinguished guest, just uh, Leo Butari. Leo is the founder and managing partner of Peer Innovation. Leo is an award-winning author of three books and a short fourth one. <laughs> and the most recent one came out in 2020 called Peer Innovation, What Peer Advisory Groups Can Teach Us About Building High-Performing Teams. He's also a keynote speaker, a podcaster, a workshop facilitator, uh, advisory board member, opinion columnist for CEO World Magazine, and an adjunct professor for Rutgers University, and named top performing at, and requ top requested speaker for Vistage year over year. Hello, Leo. Twice in one week. How lucky I am. <laughs> well, me too. Um, really a terrific opportunity to get to spend some time with your group and meet your members and really enjoyed that quite a bit. So it's great that we get a chance to um, talk today as well. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, your workshop is really impactful. And what I loved, it really provided a lot of clarity around the importance of the people you surround yourself with. And it, and that it really does matter and something maybe we don't always think about. So I know we have limited time to cover so much that we, we talked about during the workshop, but I thought we'd focus on some of the more meatier topics. And I'd love to start with really a basic, but really insightful topic. The name of the workshop was who you surround yourself with matters. So I'd love to start with why does it matter? Well, it's so interesting. It's kind of always matters. Right. I mean, one of the things that people identify with because it's what they intuitively understand and what they've experienced their whole life is the power of peers. Right. In school, when, you know, we look to one another, we we valued one another, um, you know, in, in a big way. You know, as students, we looked, you know, to each other during those times of uncertainty. Right. And all those things. You know, I share a story about when my daughter was really young and something that took place in her, her daycare and all of a sudden you know, it was something that was very upsetting. But once the first kid starts to cry, it triggers the second, third, fourth, and fifth. Because in those moments, again, we are hardwired to feed off of one another. And that doesn't change, you know, as we get older. We think about peer influence as the impact of the, the people have on us, um, you know, who surround us, right? But when we think about peer advantage, which is really kind of what we covered quite a bit um, during our workshop, it's when we're more intentional about the people who surround us, when we're more selective, strategic, and structured about how we engage one another, then we can take peer influence, which is already really pervasive and really powerful, and we really turn up the dial on that. So you know, on that topic, and, and probably it's more on the peer influence, do you feel things have changed over the last 10 years, um, one way or another? Do you think it's it's become more important with so much craziness now going on in the world, or is it kind of the same as it was over the last 10 years? No, I, I think, it, I think it's far greater. And what's interesting now is we look to our peers, if you will, because we may have a shared interest in a topic or any subject matter or a product we want to buy, or we, we want to send our kid to college, what book we want to read and all that. We don't know these people from Adam yet. We seek out their experiences with things. You know, I pointed out uh, in the Edelman Trust Barometer, which, as you know, is a study of public trust in institutions, government, business, media, and NGOs. Now, I pay attention to that study because when we don't trust our institutions, who do we look to? We have to look to one another. And it was kind of interesting because you look back in 2003, 2005, 2006, and there was a real move from people just wanting to hear from trusted authorities to corroborate what companies were saying about their products and services and all of that, to that not being good enough anymore. And it became, I want to hear from the client, from the customer directly. And once that started to happen, and once we now gained the tools, not only to share our reviews, share our ideas and thoughts beyond our friends and neighbors, and we could share it with the world, we were going to change the world. It's why all of us were named Time Magazine's Person of the Year back in 2006. And of course, we've seen a lot you know, um, good and bad, I think, from that experiment in terms of, of things. But what was interesting about it was, and here's how it's changed. 
again, when you look at that 2003, 2005, 2006, we were in this conversation about who to believe. By 2018, we're not sure what to believe anymore. And this has a lot to do with um, what Edelman described as information hygiene. The idea is that when most of us hear information that aligns with our worldview, we will spread that information most of the time without necessarily vetting it. So this is how this information can be shared so easily. And, and I think that's become difficult. I think we have to be responsible for the information we share, recognizing that we have incredible influence over one another. And I think when we look at millennials and Gen Zs in particular, who, by the way, are going to be about 64% of the workforce by 2025 and 75% of the workforce by 2030, there's a lot of this horizontal communication that is taking place. It's not so much about looking to authority anymore and trusting leadership. It's about really engaging and trusting one another. And I think the more as leaders we tap into that, that we tap into not just looking at leading our companies from a you know, vertical senior VP, VP, director, manager perspective, but we recognize that we have influencers in our companies that may not have the fanciest title, but they really will have a lot of sway with other employees. And I think recognizing who they are and engaging them, especially when we have a new policy, a new change initiative, a new strategy of some sort, so that we can get the kind of alignment necessary to give things a fair chance. Um, you know, so it, I think it's those kinds of things that represent a real, um, you know, evolution. And I think make this idea of our peers arguably that much more important today. And it will continue to be that way um, into the next decade for sure. So, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, this is such a big change for leaders to, first of all, be aware of and figure out how to harness it, right? How to um, leverage it to their advantage or or maximize the potential there. So you touched on a few things that they could do. First of all, I think it sounds, based on what you just said, it sounds like it's really understanding um, those people may not be in your organizational chart, mm -hmm. but who are the influencers, if you will? And how do you... Um, is it really socialize, you know, things with them or well, what should a leader do? You know, what, what are some of the steps and some of the, the things they should be thinking about to uh, take advantage and, and, and harness the power of these people who are influential? Sure. I think it's about reaching into your organization um, beyond your direct reports. And I think it's being a really good listener and asking a lot of questions. The relationship that millennials and Gen Zs expect with their leaders is very different than probably you or I. I certainly grew up in a household where I was just the kid. And those were the parents. They weren't. That was the deal. And I went into companies that were very much more about command and control. Um there wasn't any sense of like inclusive leadership and what do you think and and how do we you know harness the really good ideas and perspectives that people at every level in the organization can bring um and i think leaders who have found a way to be inclusive you know most of the time employees they don't it's not about whether you have to agree with them 100% of the time. Like if I come to a CEO and I voice my opinion on it, it's not like, okay, my expectation is that you're going to do whatever I suggested. But I want to feel heard, number one. And then sometimes, um, you know, when those suggestions from the ranks do find their way into improving a situation, whether it's culture, whether it's strategy, whatever it happens to be, then that is really powerful. And it's it's great for leaders when if you're paying all these people with all these great talents and gifts, we need to unlock those gifts by making sure that they feel part of what's going on. And I think people tend to, um, you know, certainly have a stake in something that they hand a hand in creating, right? They, they want yeah. it to be you know, successful. <laughs> and also I think there's this idea, cause I hear from CEOs all the time who say to me, you know, the people don't like change. And I don't think people have a problem with change, to be honest. I think people don't resist change, they resist being changed. So, and, mm. and that basically comes from, um, 
you know, actually it's a something I read a long time ago from, from Peter Senge uh, in the fifth discipline that really rang true with me and certainly with all the experiences I have in terms of what I'm doing in my work today. And that if you can involve people uh, in the change and give them a voice, then it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. So we spoke a lot about psychological safety and in a lot of uh, the leaders in the room, it, it was a new concept to them or they just haven't really thought about that. So mm. what does this mean and why is it important for leaders to focus on, especially in today's organization? Yeah, sometimes that term psychological safety just is like, you know, it really comes across as a very a academic, deep, you know, type of thing. And I think the reality of it, and as much as I really love Amy Ed Edmondson's work on this from Harvard Business School, and I would encourage anyone who wants to learn more about psychological safety to um, to look at her work. But by the same token, I really like the way uh, Timothy Clark simplifies psychological safety in a way where he talks about it in four stages. Um, you know, one essentially is how do I create a sense of belonging for people in my company so that they really feel, you know, a part of the team in a very rich and deep way. Second, that they're free to ask questions or even admit mistakes, right? That they can, they, they're not afraid to ask the dumb question, if you will, that, you know, three or four other people sitting around the table have the same question, right? But they're fearless about that. And they know that they're not going to be made fun of or ridiculed or looked down upon because they have a question. Um, third is the idea of contributing ideas. So now that you feel that sense of belonging, you're certainly not unafraid to ask questions and getting informed. Now you can feel comfortable contributing ideas uh, to the company that can be really helpful. And then last but not least, it's really about challenging the process, right? Maybe there's a way we do things that maybe we should re-examine, or maybe the leader, um, you know, is is worth challenging on something. And again, this is in service of the broader purpose. This isn't about calling people out or, or being negative or anything like that. It's like, here's what we're all here to do. You know, as you mentioned, or, you know, that we had a workshop together, of course, and part of one of the companies I talked about was Mullen Love. Mullen Love Advertising Agency, headquartered out of Boston. They have all these incredible global brands. You know, the level of psychological safety there is evident in that they are there to fight for the best idea. They're there to create the best advertising in the world. And that's their focus. And it allows for a level of curiosity and candor um, that I think is is really you know, powerful. Um, Craig Weber um, is someone who I really respect his work a lot. And he has a book called Conversational Capacity that I think is really worth uh, spending time on. It's kind of this balance of candor and curiosity and finding the sweet spot in being able to have dialogue that's really about um, the subject to hand and not about the people having the conversation. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, those kinds of things uh, I think are really important to focus on. Yeah, it's also interesting because there's a lot of conversation about an inclusive environment. And I like I, I like the focus on the belonging. So inclusive is one thing, but how do you make them feel they belong? And I think those steps you shared is a little different take on that. So um, thank you. That's interesting. And well, asking a, people a questions. really important topic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, th there's that famous story about the woman who meets two prime ministers, right? And the first prime, and he said, what did you think of them? And he said, well, I thought the first prime minister I met was the most interesting person in the world. She said, but the second prime minister made me feel like I was the most interesting person in the world, right? And it really kind of comes down also to how do we make people feel? And I think when we ask people questions, if we are curious about what they can contribute to the workplace, but also just curious about them, you know, in general. And people, when I, and this is with students, whether it's at Rutgers or talking to uh, CEOs or key executives or people like that, when you ask them to talk about the best leaders they've ever had, their stories are not about, you know, how they hit their numbers or how what a visionary they were or anything like that. It's about my CEO actually knew my kids' names 
You know, my CEO asked me questions. My CEO actually knew who I was and cared about what I thought. And, you know, again, it kind of speaks to that idea of feeling valued, about feeling that you belong here. Yeah. And I, I think that's incredibly powerful. So I think, um, you know, sometimes I, I definitely run into leaders who are afraid to reach into their organization because they think, because they have in their mind exactly what they want to do and they don't want to hear anything different, right? <laughs> So, because if I ask now, I'm going to start hearing, right. you know, things that maybe I'm not interested in with the idea that they're going to mess up their idea, as opposed to trying to take the approach of, hey, I have a direction, um, but I'm going to leave it maybe to my, to my people to maybe help me approve upon it. Um, one of the great quotes I love from Thomas Jefferson is that he said, as matters of style swim with the current and matters of principle stand like a rock. So I think for the CEOs out there who say, you know what, our quality standards, our values, our commitment to excellence, our commitment to excellent client service, whatever happens to be, those are those stay. Those are are that's those don't get compromised. How we go about delivering that, though, in a new world may be subject to some conversation about how do we just get a little bit better. And uh, so I think that's uh, worthy of some conversation with our with our people. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, it is interesting when you think back of, hey, you know, the company you were at, the culture or meeting, it is when you do feel heard. It is when you do feel, hey, it matters that I'm there and people recognize that. So, um, yeah, really important uh, and concept. Another, another great example of that is in the NES 159 challenge, um, which was an effort to help uh, at the time, this was back in 2019, Iliad Kipchoge, who's the former world record holder in the marathon, to, because he was considered a one in a generation talent, where we could create the conditions under which a human could run a marathon in under two hours, which is like mm. unheard of, you know, the, the idea of being able to do that, you know. Um, and it's, by the way, it's being able to run around a lap on your local track uh, in 68 seconds, but to do it 105 times in a row. Most people could never do it one lap in 68 seconds, let, let alone do that, just to give you or, a sense of or, what Or that... one lap just in general, regardless no, no, of yeah. how long it takes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> then walk. Um, but what was interesting about this is, so so the CEO, his name is Sir Dave Brailsford, puts together all of these experts, everybody from looking at the weather, to the shoes, to the gear, to the nutrition, to the physiotherapy, to all kinds of things. It was really rather extraordinary. So how do you create, A, a sense of belonging among all of these experts from various fields, but also how do you connect them in a way where they understand how to work together and they can discover things so you don't have all these silos? And one of the things he did that I thought was brilliant was he said, you know, when people say there are no eyes on your team, he says, that's ridiculous. There's a lot of eyes on your team. <laughs> and he said, and the more you understand that, the more you recognize that. So for the NES 159 challenge, the goal was clear. Help Ilya Kipchoge run the marathon in under two hours. The purpose, however, was to inspire the human family that we can all get a little bit better at what we do, right? We can make these small adjustments and get a little bit better. But what he wanted to know he reached into the organization, had one-to-one -one conversations with every person and said, okay, here's our goal and here's our purpose. I want to know why this matters to you. Why are you here? Why is this work meaningful for you? And the more he, what he created, what he called a not shared purpose so much, because sometimes shared purpose can be having a purpose that everyone else kind of complies with. He talked about it being a connected purpose. So... Mm. Love that. So, Margaret, you may have a purpose and a reason for doing this. Here's let's see how those two connect. And now I know how to keep you engaged and I know how to how that may be different from your colleague or from you know someone else. Right. And I think the ability to do that was creating a great sense of belonging, creating a, a sense of communication among the team members that was so powerful that they created synergies that they had no idea existed. And because of that, um, he, he actually did break um, two hours uh, in that run back. Wow. It's not considered an official world record because it wasn't under race conditions and all that. But just the idea that a human being 
could do that if if um yeah. it was it was rather extraordinary and, and i think a, a testament not just to kipchoge but the entire team that yeah. helped make that possible including 42 pace runners by the way crazy amazing right <laughs> when i hear that especially the connected purpose a sense of belonging and more communication i take that back to even the peer group i lead um, and how important, you know, we, we talked about purpose, purpose of the group, but per, you know, what is your purpose of being part of this? And I love that it isn't a shared purpose, that the connected purpose makes so much more sense. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and, and, you know, to bring up the group is, is great in that, you know, um, groups and teams are different. Um, I defined them at least from my sense and my terminology is that a group is designed to help the individual members and for those individual members to help one another. A team is designed to create a shared work product or maybe to like win an NBA championship or do something that only a team can do together. Um, groups are hardwired to help one another grow and learn and and try things and experiment and you know just stretch themselves and get better. And I think when you can bring some of the principles of what groups do so well and bring that into teams, it not only helps teams work together more effectively, but now you're creating even you're you're creating better individual contributors on top of that, where everyone kind of improves their craft just just a little bit more. And and they get to know one another and what they do. We talked a bit about in your group, for example, of how important it is for everyone to be crystal clear and what their aspirations and goals are in terms of what do I want for myself and what I want from my organization? How the how can the group help me get there? The greater clarity they have about that, the more that now they understand exactly what success looks like. Now everyone in the room, including you, knows exactly what kind of help they need. And now I, as a member, know exactly what I can do to help others. And that's clear to me. So again, when you create that kind of clarity and that kind of communication, then it delivers a level of collaboration that makes everybody better. And, you know, the idea of the workshop, as you all well know, was to give people some models and a common language so that they could be even that much more intentional about making that possible. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And and I think that came really through at the group. Sorry, I have a <coughs> tickle. Oh, bless you. It's okay. So, Changing topics just a little bit, but it's really on, um, you know, some of the similar concepts. But you shared a model of the five factors of high-performing teams. Can you walk the audience through this? Yeah. So when we were talking about high-performing groups, high-performing teams, you know, as I mentioned, it's kind of, well, what does that mean, right? <laughs> In terms of what does that look like? Of course, when we looked at it from the group perspective, we studied organizations all over the world, and they helped define for us what that was. Um, and we found in those groups, and we've since um, found it to be with teams as well, that um, they have a robust learning achieving cycle. They learn really well together and they help each other try and learn and celebrate and do those kinds of things that fuel a commitment to uh, what it takes to really be great, right? Uh, and the second one, of course, was this idea of intentional and collateral learning, right? The idea that we take in information very intentionally sometimes, but we also learn from how we learn. How we engage one another can help us build muscles around things like listening and asking more precise questions and not run, rushing to judgment and jumping to conclusions and, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, but none of those things are going to happen by putting a bunch of people in a room and hoping for the best. So this is where the five factors came into play. And it's about having the right people in the room, right? People who share something in common. You know, in the case of a CEO peer advisory group, for example, they're all the CEO of their company. They're the chief decision maker. They know exactly what it's like to have the responsibility that goes with it. Not to mention, they've got to look at everything. You can't look at the world through a sales, marketing, HR, legal, finance lens, they have to look at all of it and right. all the stakeholders and all the responsibilities. But so to be in a room of people who have that shared understanding of what it's like to sit in that chair becomes huge. So that's kind of part of what determines those right people. They also have to have a, you know, let's face it, some shared uh, beliefs about what values and behaviors are do we need to bring to the table for one another 
to help make us really effective in working together. And then third, of course, is making sure that you get all the perspectives in the room that lend to a really complete conversation. Uh, second is psychological safety, right? Because you can have all the right people in the room, but now you have to unlock all that talent. Now they have to feel just like we talked about before, like Timothy Clark, right? That sense of belonging and bonding, the ability to ask questions and admit mistakes, to, to be very forthcoming about being prepared to contribute ideas, um, and also to be able to challenge one another and even challenge what the group can do better, right? In terms of challenging yeah. a process. Um, third is productivity. Obviously, that becomes key. Are we as effective and efficient with our time together as we possibly can be? What does that look like? How do we use every minute possible? Um, fourth becomes a culture of accountability. And it's not a culture of accountability that makes these people feel like they've got to come into the group and play defense all the time. It's much more about accepting personal responsibility for bringing their A games every single meeting as they defined for themselves through those values and behaviors. Uh, and also to follow up and follow through with one another. So I, I'd given an example that if I were a member of the group and I brought a challenge I was having, uh, they helped me through it. I heard some thinking that really resonated with me. And I said, OK, here are the things that I want to do by next meeting to take steps toward meeting this challenge. So I should be the one coming in the next meeting saying, OK, let me tell you where I am with that. Of nothing else out of sheer gratitude, but it creates a level of accountability. And maybe more importantly than that, it makes sure that there's not a learning opportunity lost, right? Because as you know, we can all sit around a conference room table and come up with the coolest ideas in the whole world. And then sometimes yeah. when that plan hits real life, it deals with something different. If we're not bringing that back to the group, we're doing a disservice wow. to everyone. And then of course, last but not least was the leadership. The idea that at least in terms of what we had studied with groups, that the most effective leaders were um, uh, servant leaders, that they were a part of the group, not apart from it, right? That they were very much engaged, all having a shared responsibility for whatever results um, they desired to achieve. And then also the leader took primary responsibility to be the steward of those other four factors. So you as the chair of a Vistage group, for example, are always paying attention. Do we have the right people in the room exhibiting those right mm -hmm. behaviors? Because that's like super important to maintaining, you know, the whole integrity of what happens uh, in a group that there's an environment of psychological safety, but also how well is everyone using it and really leveraging it and, you know, for themselves and for others. And of course, you're always looking at productivity. And while you're not going to be the enforcer of member-to-member -member accountability, you can provide them context and resources so they find that for themselves in a way it serves them. So those five factors have proven not only to be um, you know, critical time and time again, whether the group is just starting or a group's been together for 25 years with founding members still in the group, and I've worked with all of them and everything in between. Um, but it's remarkable what it does for teams when you can bring that intentionality, when you can bring models to the table, and you can get people to really talk about what they want for themselves and what their expectations are for one another. And um, it's hugely and highly effective. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And that they actually have control. It's not about, oh, I'm sitting in a group and someone, it, it's someone else's group. It's their group. Exactly. It's their group and their team. And it's their focus to, <laughs> as you said, bring their A game. So when you look at these five factors, what would you say based on your research and all the experience you have with the workshops, what, what's, the, what's the one that is the biggest challenge, would you say, for the leaders? Do you see something that... Uh, so, um, so I think it's it's because it's a kind of multi. So on one hand, I would say psychological safety, creating the environment of psychological safety and the feeling that the environment is safe. I think a lot of groups do really successfully. Um, back when I first started doing these workshops and I would run them as kind of an assessment exercise and I would ask groups to rate their psychological safety as a group on a scale of one to 10. Time after time, they're all saying tense, right? They're, we're unbelievable. You know, we can talk about anything, whatever, right? Um, so then I would continue with the workshop and I definitely was not feeling that level of candor. And I thought I need to go about this a different way. 
So a group I had visited, they were together for 17 years. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I asked them, you know, what, what are you on a scale of one to 10? They said 10. And then I went to each person around the table and said, how well do you believe you leverage that environment for yourself and others? Now, they have to answer it in front of everyone. So they're not going to all say, oh, I'm a 10, because everyone's going to look at them like, really? You don't share anything. <laughs> and so they're very honest about that. And that day... And what is proven over time is they could be a 10 and they're not lying. They've seen the environment as a 10. They've seen it work. They've seen it in action. But their ability to use it consistently runs closer to a six and a half or a seven. Now people start looking at one another and saying, wow, we have this environment that we don't enjoy anywhere with people who really understand what we're all about. How in the world are we leaving that value on the table? Right. So now it's a question again of how do we be more intentional about going from a seven to much closer to a 10? Now, granted, everybody's a little different. Some people are a little more private and keep things a little closer to the best by nature. Other folks will tell their life story to anyone who will yeah. listen, you know, and you've got everything in between. But the important sure. thing is for get people thinking about how can I change myself to just do just do a little more, just try a little harder yeah. each and every meeting to recognizing it, of course, for the act of courage and generosity that it is. But that when everyone's playing at a high level there, now you start really unlocking all of the possibilities. And whether that's a group or a team, uh, that becomes really important. And by the way, I guess I started with that also, because if you ever want to create a healthy culture of accountability, you have to have the psychological safety at a high level in order to make that happen, or it's just not going to work. Yeah. Well, so well said and so well describing at least my group that I think we do create that environment, but everyone comes with, you know, some are much more open and, and, willing to share quickly and the others are testing it <laughs> for them to get more comfortable. Um, but that's okay. As long as they're moving forward with that. So, you know, and part summary. of doing that and part of doing that and what was very evident in your group is that you also have to have fun. If you're going to spend eight hours a day together <laughs> doing all this, it can't be all, you know, right. um, you, you've got to enjoy yourself. You have to celebrate. You have to have a sense of humor about things, maybe. And it was really fun to see that in your group. And I think the best groups that I've seen um, in terms of those who are really, really effective also really have a lot of fun doing what they're doing as well. Yeah, good. Well, thank you for that. So you also talked about the necessity and power of celebrating the small mm. wins. Can you elaborate on this a little bit? Yeah, um, this is... This is interesting in that when I talked about the learning achieving cycle earlier, and it's basically learning, sharing, applying, achieving, um, that was the original learning achieving cycle, which is kind of why it's called that. <laughs> there is a fifth step now, though, called celebrating. I had always considered celebrating part of the achieving phase. The reality, though, is that too few people celebrate. They're always looking to the next thing. You know, they get to one goal, they're on to the next, they're on to the next, or they've got a project that they the goal may be three years out in terms of what they're going to do. So how do you keep people, you know, fired up and working hard and doing what they need to do to get there? And oftentimes, you know, I find that when you have a company that celebrates the small wins, that isn't always lamenting about how far they still have to go, but they actually take time and say, you know what? Three months ago, we were here. Look where we are today. We should really take stock and really celebrate that and show the progress we're making. Hey, our goal may be, you know, two years down the road, but we are doing really, really great, right? And letting making people aware of how far we've come. That's the kind of fuel you need. I'm not sure it's any different than um, in an Indy 500 race where, you know, they have to stop for fuel and they have to get new tires. They're not making it 500 miles, right? So <laughs> you know, our people can't make it 500 miles either, if you will, without a little fuel, without a little of that energy, without that recognition and that feeling that, hey, we're doing really well together. Or maybe there's some changes we need to make or things we need to do to help us even be that much more effective. All well and good. But this idea of keeping your eye on the prize, I think is not particularly great advice. It's not that you don't keep the goal in mind, but the more you fixate on it, especially the longer term goals, the more difficult it's going to be to keep and to actually achieve that goal 
uh, without just burning everybody out. Yeah, keep the motivation and the uh, excitement going as well. Yeah. Good. Yeah, that's a great concept. So I know we're running out of time. I have a few more questions. Are you good <laughs> Please, for a few more minutes? You bet. Okay. Okay. Of course. Good. So the next question is a little bit self-serving because I do lead the CEO executive peer advisory group. Um, and I personally see the impact and the magic that occurs in those sessions. And it's it's really a, a wonderful thing. I leave each day and hope my members too excited. It was a hard day of work and fun and you know all of that, but um, it, it's really magical. So what I'd love, you know, you've spent years researching and writing about this. I'd love to get your perspective on why peer advisory groups, especially at the senior level, is important and impactful. So I know you 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 talked a little bit, you talked about it already, but I'm really talking about, you know, I'm I'm thinking of these peer groups outside of your company um, and especially at the most senior level. So what if, yeah. what's your research and what have you observed? You know, we live in a very complex, fast moving world. The idea that any one of us is gonna sit in our office with the door shut and figure it all out by ourselves doesn't really make a lot of sense. Asking for help, which oftentimes maybe generations ago was considered a sign of weakness, I think today people recognize it as the act of resourcefulness that it is. Mm -hmm. And that if we're not taking advantage of the the ideas and perspectives and the opinions and experiences of people, again, who are sitting in our chair, who can sh you know share kind of how they approach things and what they do and how they see the world, um, you know, then I think we're really missing out in a very big way. When the Power of Peers was written back in um, 2016 and you know published back then, it was really done because of the fact that when you look at the number of people that could be in a group and the number of people who actually are, the gulf is enormous. I mean, it's huge. And yet these groups are incredibly powerful and incredibly effective because, again, when you bring that commitment and those perspectives and kind of the generosity people bring to one another um, to the table, some great things happen. You just need to provide them the framework and the forum uh, to be able to do that. And so that was really the idea behind it. And I think since that time, um, not only, of course, has Vistage grown, um, but other organizations have grown. There are many more people in this space today than they've ever been before. And yeah. my hope is that as people see the opportunities, they will look and find out what is the right group for me, you know, as opposed to thinking that I'm not going to be in a group. How many times when you speak to anyone who's been doing this for a while, the first thing they'll tell you is, I wish I did this five years ago. I wish I did this 10 years ago or 20 years ago, Right. And and I think there's something to be said for that. So I think for those of you out there who, you know, uh, haven't done this before, I don't think there's a reason to wait. <laughs> I think it's, it's really um, maybe a, a good idea to kind of heed the advice of uh, so many of these folks who are in groups today and have experienced such incredible value from it. Um, that you don't have to wait another five or 10 years. Uh, I would say to try to explore it now and to look and see which is the right group for you based on what it is that you're looking for. Thank you for that. And and probably a great one to end it on. You know, I also hear <laughs> from my members that say, boy, I should have done this a long time ago. So um, thank you for uh, your perspective on that. And thank you for your time. Um, what... Great. I can't wait. I, I took more notes uh, than I took even, you know, I was like, oh, that's a good one. I did hear that one last time. So um, thank you so much. And thank you all for watching. This is the stuff that grows is made of.